Okay, happy Sabbath, Olet. Wow, the church is still so full. I gave my testimony earlier this morning, and it was pretty much the same size of a crowd. I praise God. Um, thank you for being here. I know just as I am, he is very happy right now, and heaven is rejoicing that we are all still here together. I'd also like to say that I'm very blessed with the wonderful wisdom that Dr. Boutte has shared with us earlier. Na blessed po ba kayo? He, um, you know, it is really a privilege for us to um, have him join us here in Bacolod because he usually um, dedicates his whole life, of course, to his ministry and his family. So I'm very thankful that my mom was able to bring him to Bacolod with us for the very first time. And I'd also like to say thank you to Brother Cesar on behalf of my mom and myself for that wonderful song in the garden because we love that song. In fact, my mom and I were singing it this morning as we were getting ready for Sabbath. So praise God and of course your friends and the, the choir, that, the men's choir that joined you. Okay, so um, I would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to lend me an ear for the next few minutes. I promise this will go by very fast um, and I just hope that you're open, um, especially in your hearts and minds, to, to receive some of these precious lights that I have received and that have uh, made a very big difference in my life. Um, and what I'm going to be discussing today is especially important for a lot of the women, but I'll, I'll touch on a few of um, the tips that I can give for the men as well. So in case I forget about the men um, later on, just remind me and then I'll, I'll mention that as well, since my presentation is mainly tailored for the ladies, of course. Okay, so as um, our wonderful speaker earlier mentioned, I was Miss Earth in 2009. First to the Philippines, I won Miss Philippines Earth, and um, that gave me the chance to represent the Philippines in the international pageant Miss Earth International, where I won first runner-up, or Miss Earth Air. And um, for me, this was quite an interesting experience. I had just come back from New York, and I had finished nursing, I got my license, and um, I really, um, believed in the advocacy of this pageant, so um, with the with, um, advocacy on, on the side and um, the competition night itself, this was taken in Boracay, this photo, um, the night that I competed. In fact, I was wearing a Michael Cinco creation, one of our most renowned fashion designers to date, that is also Filipino. Um, this photo I chose to include here because I know, looking back now, that what I knew then, I of course it didn't know what, what it really meant to dress the way I did there and um, what it meant to the eyes of the Lord. So who among you here spends a lot of time in the morning dressing up and figuring out what to wear, just like this girl? Can you raise your hands? Who thinks about what they're going to wear every morning? I can't see any hands except the men's hands. So you all don't mind what, what outfit you wear today or any day? Come on, I'm sure you also give it some thought, especially yung mga, mga dalaga dito, right? Because we really care about our wardrobe. Why? Because it reflects who we are. In fact, if there's a saying, you are what you eat, there's also a follow-up saying that applies, you are what you wear. And as Adventists, we ought to dress according to the principles of the Bible and the counsel that was given to us by the spirit of prophecy, correct? In fact, speaking of the SOP, in Education, page 247, the love of display produces extravagance. And I can firsthand testify to this because when I was a beauty queen and I was representing my country and I was dressed and adorned in the luxurious wardrobes that the world has to offer, I will admit to you that it creates a sense of pride in my mind and in my heart because I am proud of what I'm wearing. Question. Where did pride originate? On earth? In heaven. In fact, looking back to our history, Lucifer was probably the most beautiful angel. He was so gifted from God and 
he, in fact, when it comes to singing, he doesn't just sing one voice, he sings 10 voices at the same time. That's how gifted he was and how special he was in God's eyes. So this developed eventually, this beauty that he possessed developed into pride, right? And it was eventually the reason why he rebelled against God because he developed that snare in his heart and mind that was built out of so much beauty and just so much perfection. And that, that is the risk, of course, of so much emphasis on our display. And uh, when I was up there, and looking back now, I realized, oh no, I, I praise God that he has pulled me back on track to realize that we should not focus so much of our attention on what we wear in terms of developing that further and investing too much of our time, efforts, and money on what we wear. In fact, if we go back to the Bible, there's an answer for everything, right? And when it comes to dress, I'd like to invite all of you to read with me the following scripture found in 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, so that whenever you teach any topic related to dress and modesty, you can refer to this key text. Let us read together. Very loud, okay? We need energy so that we can really understand God's word. Let's read. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Thank you. Two important portions of this verses, or these verses. Number one, we should clothe ourselves as women in modest apparel. So modesty is, is really important here. This is, if there's one thing you want someone to compliment you on, it is the form of modesty that you possess. And I had an interview earlier, and I'll just repeat um, what I said on how you as yourself can know if what you're wearing today or any day is modest. Number one, when you look in the mirror and you check out your outfit, you ask yourself the first question, is my outfit going to tempt any man? And if the answer is no, then that is one confirmation that your attire is modest. Okay? So, kung walang matutukso or matatempt sa outfit ko, especially when I go to church on Sabbath, I do not want to tempt any pastors in particular as a woman. <laughs> then you're on the right track and you're, you can consider yourself modest. And number two, the second question you ask yourself as a woman is, is there any other woman that would feel ashamed of what I am wearing? Kasi minsan, or usually, ang mga iban nga bay, kung nahuya na sila sa ginasuksok sang isa ka bay, it's because it's usually not modest, right? And we say, what is she wearing? Oh, daw akong nahuya. When, when, you, when you feel that, it's because it's inappropriate and it's most likely not modest. So those are two immediate tips that you can always revert to those two questions. Um, and of course, referring back to our key text, God really emphasizes the importance of women professing godliness with good works. So if you want to be a godly woman, which I hope you do, and if you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman who is the virtuous woman, you should read the whole chapter. It's beautiful. And every woman should, be a, should want to aspire to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Um, then we should show this through good works. And this is what God cares about. Now, I had a conversation with um, our friends from Iloilo earlier. And yes, a lot of people... You, you, you might fear that, especially mga babae, they might think when you start dressing modestly, nga ah, daw, daw ka ba doy or daw ka out of date, hindi ka man in fashion, sa mga ginasuksok mo, taman ka conservative. Here's my answer to those women. And yes, I know that sometimes they're innocent as well and they don't know, but would you rather please you know, men or these women and the trend of the world, or would you rather please God in what you wear? That's always what you want to ask yourself. 
it is far better to please God. And that's the only thing we should really do here on earth. So that's what you can tell them. If it's in accordance with God's will, you're on the right track, even with your fashion. Now, here's the problem. According to the Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 634, Satan is constantly devising some new style of dress that will prove an injury to physical and moral health. So, yes, it is a fact that fashion is used as a tool by the enemy to injure our moral and physical health. Of course, our morality goes down because as women, if we tempt men, that's already like an, a, a moral type of risk, right? And at the same time, if we dre dress very minimally and we show a lot of skin, for that matter, we start to create dangers in the men's minds and also dangers for ourselves as women. Because let's say you have to commute or you have to walk around. You at risk yourself by capturing too much attention of what it is that you're wearing especially from the opposite sex. And let's remember, men are wired differently from women. I can confirm that. I have three brothers, and I know exactly how they think and function. So I've learned a lot about the nature of men. So it's really important that we guard ourselves and that we shield ourselves. And the first way we can do that is with the, what we wear as women. Okay, so it's our protection to dress modestly. And that way, you don't increase your safe, risk of safety as well. Because imagine, you're going to jump on a jeepney. What's more dangerous, that you jump on a jeepney in a long falda, like what I'm wearing today, or in a mini skirt? I'll leave that question to you. Now, going back to this, the enemy is very, very subtle. No? Satan is very abrupt in how he introduces um, this sense of fashion that will prove injury to health and morality of especially the women. Let's look at the history of fashion. I'll take you to the Victorian era. This was about 1840s onwards, right? A lot of us wished that we lived during this time because when we look at the costumes of these women, it reminds us of princesses, right? They're all dressed in abundance of fabric and um, what's also really popular during their time, and it's still being used today, is the corset. Ayan, who here loves to wear corsets? <laughs> okay, well, I'll definitely admit that I loved wearing corsets because as a beauty queen, it was very important for our vital statistics to have a small waistline. So, kahit ako ang imong iban nga measurements, basta gamay ang imong hawak, Nice, because it gives you that Coca-Cola figure or effect, right? So the women during the Victorian era, they were very much into these types of dressings. This process here of tying the corset together is called lacing. And I read a story that there was one woman, she's so used to a very tight corset during that era. Every day she wears that, right? So she knows how tight it needs to be. One day, Wala ang mga upod niya na usually naglalace sa iya. So, she had to ask some other people to help her lace her corset together. And the problem was that it was, in the end, those new people didn't lace it tight enough. Because she knows how tight it should be since she's regularly wearing it. So, she was so frustrated, she started to cry. And she got um, angry at these people that she decided to lace up her corset herself. How did she do this? According to the story I read, she took one end of the corset, she tied it around one of the, so the, this portion here, of a bed, so she tied it really tight, and then she held on to the other end and she walked forward, right? Astama tight gidnasha, really, really tight. And um, when she felt that it was tight enough, then she held on to it, of course, and walked back to that part. And then she tied up the rest into a ribbon. But essentially, she was already addicted to the tightness of, of this corset because that's what she was used to. And yes, Externally, it looks really shapely and beautiful for these women, but the true question we should ask ourselves is, 
what effect does that have on the woman's health and what really happens to us internally? Let's take a look. So since women during that era used to do this every day, it started to affect the structure of their bodies internally, yung mga organs nila. So usually our organs function with optimum space, right? And the first example I'm going to cite is our breathing because proper breathing involves diaphragm breathing, right? You really inhale and exhale without any difficulty through the diaphragm. But the moment you wear a corset, and women who've tried this can attest to this, is that you don't, won't be able to experience diaphragm breathing anymore. You'll only experience breathing up to your chest. So the air gets trapped halfway through the whole path of breathing, and therefore your oxygen is limited, and your body does not receive all that oxygen. That's the first danger. It already affects our breathing. The second danger is that our internal organs, like our stomach, our intestines, our liver, um, our kidneys, they all get compressed. And of course, if this happens every day, they cannot function optimally and there's really an injury that happens. Tissues get scarred and um, who knows what um, type of atrophy could happen as well, no? internally. All our muscles cannot really ex expound for that matter. And finally, it even affects the rib cage, especially through the years. So you really see um, it narrowing down and your hips. And um, that was a serious problem. That's why a lot of women during that period died early. So they didn't live very long. Now, the worst part is that it wasn't just the woman's body who got affected by the corset. Even during child labor, a lot of women died because it affected the way they delivered children and the organs of the babies were also compromised once the baby was born because it starts with the mother. So the narrowing of the waist and, and hips, in fact, not just the corset, but the hoop skirt was the, the partner of the corset. So kung tight sa babao, if it's tight at the top, dapat napaka wide and um, princessy almost of a skirt is what you should be wearing, right? Um, so this is what they call the hoop skirt. Um, and this is made out of um, boning material. And it is very, very heavy. So this weight is added to your hips. And it's also very injurious to the body of the woman. And again, it affects how women deliver their children because you know, there's just so much injury and damage over the years that is caused because of the costumes that they used to wear. And one thing I also want to emphasize is that for them, the more extravagant and more fabric the woman wore in their society, the more rich and beautiful she was considered because she had so much adorning on her. In fact, you won't believe this, but one, um, one dress weighed about 40 pounds. 40 pounds of fabric on a woman's dress. And they have to suffer just to be fashionable for their era. And the worst part is, they didn't have any cars yet that time. So imagine how much they had to walk and they would go on their carriages. And I don't even want to know how these women sat in those skirts because they couldn't really sit and how they could go to the restroom. It's just horrible. I, th I remember in France, they used to even have something like a pot hanging underneath so that when they urinate, they just stay that way. They urinate under the skirt and then they place it away after. So it's, it's really unhealthful for that matter. And the petticoats are super long. May mga train pa na sila. It's like every day is their wedding day. So um, the trains, right, that are really long and, f and full of fabric. Of course, as I said, they had no cars that time. So the, the dirt of the streets, of the roads, and even of, of the horse, horse um, poop, for that matter, right? It, it stays on the streets. And when they would walk, it would, it would dust all that bacteria under the fabric of the skirts since the trains were so long. And it's so unhygienic and so unhelpful. And, um, you know, the women who couldn't afford to wear a new dress every day, they wore this several days in a row. So that was, um, you know, what they, what they experienced. And that was the enemy's way of injuring their health at the time of the 1840s, no? 
Another example I want to share with you. Okay, so I usually do this when I share this part. I want to invite all of you to close your eyes. And only if you close your eyes will you be able to fully understand why I made you close your eyes. Okay. All right, open it first. I just wanted to make sure you're still listening. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the first image and then we'll close our eyes after. The first image I want to show you is a family. Where do you think this family is spending time on the photo? That's right, they're at the beach. In fact, it was around the same time as the Victorian era that what this family was wearing is actually their swimwear or their swim attire. And I always get the same reaction. People always laugh when they see this, but this is really what they used to wear. They were pretty modest. So they had covering from head to toe. Let's analyze. They had a headpiece, long sleeves, pants, even for the women under their dresses, pants. And they even had a pair of swimming shoes. Okay, so it was a complete outfit to go swimming. Okay, now let's all close our eyes. Let's all close our eyes. I still see many eyes are open. Dr. Boutte. Let's close our eyes. <laughs> there we go. Okay, thank you. Let's open them now. Okay, so what happened here? We have fast forwarded about 30 years later from the first photo I showed you. And what do we see? We see a set of women, probably girlfriends, and they're dressing for their beach attire. What is different from the first photo? Number one, is there still a headpiece? No. Okay, so no more head cap. Number two, is it still long sleeves? Okay, but it's, there's still sleeves, but they're up to the elbows. Three, are there still pants? No, they've been replaced by leggings. That's good observation. And number four, do they still have shoes? Yeah, I guess you could consider that um, a pair of thin shoes. Cool. All right. Now let's fast forward another 20 to 30 years later. And how do the women dress then? Oh, the, the cap is back. <laughs> okay, so do they still have sleeves? Ayan, sleeveless na. Is the skirt or the dress still below the knees? Above the knees na. Are they still wearing leggings? That's a trick question. Look carefully. They're actually wearing socks, high, high knee high or higher socks. And they still have a pair of shoes to swim. OK. So you can start to see. This is all going back to what I said earlier and what's written in Testimonies to the Church, that the enemy is very subtle. We're talking about years, huh? not blinking of eyes, but years um, of transition of fashion. Now. We reach the 1920s, 30s, and what happened? Oh boy, no more caps, a lot of confidence, <laughs> and sleeveless, right? So no more sleeves, and it's not even a dress anymore. It's a pair of, it's like a, a onesie, they call it. It's, um, a, jumper that's or a romper that's with shorts so no more skirt there and no more socks no more leggings no more pants so you can really see that more and more is reduced right and um what happens fast forward to our generation this is more familiar right this is what we're used to the bikini that's why when i showed you the first slide Nagkadlaw, gid ka mo. Kaya amo na ning anad sa aton sa buong uh, generation, mga amo ning uh, swimsuits, no? In fact, that's a regular two-piece. If you go to places like Brazil, it's less than that. But I won't mention these details anymore. You already know these things about worldly fashion, no? So, 
It's just to emphasize how through the generations the enemy is really using fashion to expose us. In fact, during the Victorian era, when they had an excess of fabric, remember 40 pounds per dress? What happened today? It's the complete opposite. We lack fabric nowadays, so it's very exposed. You know, once I, I was out for dinner one time and I was in an area where there's a lot of clubs also surrounding the area where I would have dinner and I just challenged myself to count how many women are wearing mini skirts that went out to party. And I, I realized that I don't even need to count because every woman is in a mini skirt, especially the younger teenagers, the young girls. So I was like, maybe I should start counting how many women are in pants or in long skirts because there were hardly any except myself. So I was really shocked to, to discover this, but this is the reality of the matter, right? If you research the history of the mini skirt, you'll be surprised because the mini skirt, this whole concept, originated in England and it was designed by a famous fashion designer, designer called Mary Quant. And um, I want it to be your homework to discover why Mary Quant decided to design a mini skirt because you'll be shocked what her, her reason was for this. In fact, it is, it is so, it is so not, not pleasant that I don't even want to mention it here. But, you know, if you're really curious to see why, why these things are designed, you should research it. Okay, and then another thing that's happening nowadays is that women are we wearing men's clothing nowadays, right? So, uso na yung mga ginasoksok sa mga lalaki, even for women. So, it's even part of the fashion trend now that women dress very corporate, women wear um, ties and and uh, bow ties even, so it's all part of fashion. And you see a lot of bloggers on the internet that, that emphasize this and you, you know, it's just, it's just not very appropriate. In fact, in Deuteronomy, it says that men should never wear women's clothing and vice versa because we really need to dress according to our gender. So let's remember that when we dress every day. And another thing that's happening nowadays is also that we should, that um, there's so much temptation to dress up in costly array. So here's an ad by Louis Vuitton. But all these brands um, are really captivating to a lot of women. We really want to wear designer clothing and designer bags and shoes. Um, but the spirit of prophecy, and of course the Bible says that this is not the way to go. We should not place go ornaments of gold and all this costly array onto ourselves. Why? The emphasis doesn't become on the woman, it becomes the item that she carries. And of course, these products cost so much money. I think a Louis Vuitton bag on average costs about $1,500 to $2,000. That is so much money that you could actually use for God's ministry or to feed the hungry, right? or to, to spread God's work with initiatives. So let's put money to good use and not to these designer products that are just a so-called trend or you know a symbol of of the worldly fashion so that's a big no-no okay another thing that's a big no-no or at least i'm having har a hard time letting go of but i absolutely love is high heels so I, I've noticed a lot of um, ladies wear high heels. In fact, sometimes I still wear high heels, but um, not, not very long. I try to refrain from it because, of course, high heels are also very unhealthful to a woman's body. Number one, we all suffer when we wear high heels. It's not comfortable. Number two, high heels are a form of tempting men. Now, you may ask how. And women can really understand how, right? Because when we wear high heels, na iiba na yung balance ng katawan natin. Kumbaga, sorry, I'm mixing Ilongo English and Tagalog. Just bear with me. But um, when we wear high heels, in order to have a balance, our private parts need to move forward. Like our chest moves forward, and our our backs move back backward basically right just so we maintain that balance so we start creating a certain curve you know that really flaunts our private areas right? 
So your chest comes out, your buttocks come out, and it just outlines our shape and figure even more. So that's, that's one thing that's, that's a problem with high heels. And of course, when you wear these shoes, your, your foot isn't flat, it, it's elevated um, in such a way that it has this curve, right? And all the pressure of your entire body, all your bones, all your organs is on your toes. So the pressure isn't going to be on the heel or it's not going to be distributed anymore, it's going to be on your toes. And eventually that also affects our blood flow all the way to our toes and it's just not something pleasant. In short, unhealthy, let's, let's be careful and try to avoid high heels when we can. I know I, I also really love to wear them to complete the look, even my Sabbath dress sometimes and I'll show you some looks where I've worn high heels with my Sabbath dresses, but if you can avoid it, Try to, to um, avoid it or bring a pair of flats so that if you're tired, you switch right away. That's what I would suggest. Now, um, I briefly mentioned what, what the scenario is, how the enemy uses fashion in history and today to affect us, no? But here's the thing. No matter how worldly and, and how fashionable the world is, let's put it that way, we have to be different, especially as Adventists, because we have the proper guidance and counsel on how to dress modestly. But there is a problem. I recently heard a story from one Filipino pastor. He's based in Loma Linda, and he was here during the time of Ted Wilson. And he shared this story with me that growing up in Loma Linda in the US, California to be precise, um, he, he already has a family. So he said, before, women used to dress very modestly in their church. But today, yung mga bata, gasok-sok na sila sang spaghetti straps, sleeveless, and mini skirts when they go to church and it's become the norm and he told me that this is very common now in the US so I'm sure I'm sure it's not just in the US it's probably everywhere but it is a problem and I'll show you why but before that another another um, important testimony I want to share with you because um, I have a Facebook page and I share a lot on on um, Facebook <clears throat> but one of the the women that heard my testimony on modest dress, she wrote me on Facebook and she told me, well, she was blessed. She said, God bless. Thanks for sharing this to us. I'm so happy to hear how you advise the young people in our church because mostly they are making the church as a place for fashion modern. So a lot of young ladies now, and this is like coming from a mother, even referencing her, you know, her own daughter and, and the young girls in the churches, they come to church to to dress very fashionable and um, it's just not very modest anymore, believe it or not. And it, it really hurts the parents, it hurts the older conservative and modest um, members of the church and most importantly, it hurts the Lord because God wouldn't want you to expose yourself that way, right? He just wants you to be healthy and to dress modestly, it's, it's really that simple. So here you have Adventists that are bothered by what's happening. And in plain short, Ellen White even said in Testimonies to the Church, Volume um, 1, page 525, God's people have to a great extent lost their peculiarity. The Bible in 1 Peter 2, 9, we are a peculiar people as Adventists. We'd like to believe that. But Ellen White says that we've, to a certain extent, lost this peculiarity and have been gradually patterning after the world. So our fashion is becoming more and more immodest, even in the church. I could care less how women in other churches dress, but when women in the Adventist church dress in immodest, and when worldliness has entered our doors and our churches, that is a problem. So we have to catch ourselves and refrain from this continuing. And that's why the dress message is so important. It doesn't just affect our health, it affects who we are as Adventists to the, to the rest of the world. Because our difference, our peculiarity needs to be obvious when we are compared with those of the world. So, malayo pa lang, kung palaktan mo, dua ka one is an Adventist and one is, let's say, of another church or of the world, kinanlan sa bayo niya pa lang, makita mo nga na Adventist ang isa. Because she dresses modestly and according to the council. So this is really important. No? Even... Even if we walk amid strangers, they will see this difference and this peculiarity. And again, going back to Proverbs 31, it says, 
from the Bible, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. So let's not compromise to be fashionable according to the world standards. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Fear God, keep his commandments, keep his counsels. We have the truth, we have the instructions. Um, Ellen White has given it to us clearly. So let's not be stubborn and let's not let fashion and pride overrule this counsel that heaven wants us to apply. Very, very important. Child Guidance, page 429. It is not your dress that makes you of value in the Lord's sight. So we're not here to, to please anyone except God. So it says here, God doesn't value what we wear. It is the inward adorning, the graces of the Spirit, the kind words, the thoughtful consideration for others that God values. And this takes us back to 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. It's all about good works, right? Modesty and good works and having that, that spirit, that, that um, inward adorning, the graces of the spirit, that inner beauty that will radiate outward. And um, this is one thing I realized, of course, through my ministry, since I am very passionate about fashion. I wanted to, to look more into this topic, and I know that a lot of young ladies can benefit from this if they dress properly. In fact, gusto ko lang ishare. No, I, um, one thing I, I realized is, let's say we want to dress properly. I agree with Dr. Boutet. I do not want to preach something that I do not practice. So as much as I can, I really dr try to dress modestly, not on Sabbath alone, seven days a week. No, but. When we see a sister that is not dressed appropriately or modest, we should never scold them and we should never point the finger at them because sometimes they're innocent and if they knew this, they would dress modestly. No? So it's important to always encourage the women, even the men, and let's pray for them and let's show them these key texts so that they, they will also understand the right way. Of course, if they know the truth already and they decide to be stubborn or it takes more time for them, that's already their, their decision. But let's always remind each other um, with encouragement that this is the way God would want us to dress modestly. Um, and earlier when I was listening to our wonderful children's choir here, I always pay close attention to the length of the skirts. It's just like automatic already because I read the councils. And do you know what the proper length is for our skirts? Who thinks our skirts should be above the knees? Hands up. Okay, I already give you a hint, Kanina, that we should not wear mini skirts, so that was easy. How about exactly at the knee length? Knee length. Okay, na yan. Okay, I see a few hands raised up. How about a few inches below the knees? Okay, more hands have been raised. How about up to our ankles? Okay, great. How about up to the floor? <laughs> okay. Well, according to the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White declared that the perfect length is up to our ankles. Okay, because it's, it doesn't reach the floor, but your extremities are still covered, so cold wind will not enter into our legs and alter the temperature of our legs. So that's, that's um, the proper answer. But if you do want to wear something a bit shorter, because let's say we live in a tropical country like the Philippines, the shortest we can go is 10 inches below the knees. That's the shortest. Nothing shorter than that. Why? Because when we sit down and we cross our legs, the skirt rises. And you want to make sure that when the skirt rises, it's still below the knees. And that's why it has to be at least 10 inches below the knees. So who here wants to show their long skirt <laughs> to everyone. No, but our goal is that every Sabbath, no, through prayer and determination, that we dress modestly and wear these longer skirts. No, and let's not judge anyone, but let's encourage one another. And then, of course, our extremities should also be covered. Um, and you may say, it's really hot, why would we cover ourselves like that? But it's really important that our overall body temperature is maintained. 
Um, in fact, the temperature around our heart, right, is the ideal temperature of the entire body. And that's why we have to make sure all our extremities are covered so that we have a, a, a general temperature for all our organs to function properly and our blood flow to be consistent. So that's the healthful um, reason behind this. And then, of course, since we live in a tropical country, even if it's long sleeve, the secret there is the fabric that you wear, the type of material. And what is the most practical material for us to wear? Yes, cotton, very important. And um, linen is also very good. Cotton and linen are great. So this is cotton and, and my skirt's linen actually. And um, you can't go wrong with those two things. Okay, and when it comes to colors, right, because we all have our favorite colors, um, the softer colors are better. You mga pastel colors, soft pink, soft blue, soft yellow, white. Um, these are great colors. They're pleasing to the eyes. Nothing too vibrant or distracting, because especially if you have to speak in front. It's better if it's something, you know, soft to the eyes. Those are those are good tips for your your dressing. Okay, we're almost done. Um, here's a photo of me reading one of my favorite books. In fact, every young child or every teenager and um, the youth or those who feel young at heart should have this book. It's called Messages to Young People because it covers dress it, and it covers many other important topics like health and love, courtship and marriage and all these other things that we need to be informed of as representatives of the youth, right? But I show this to you because there's an important quote in Messages to Young People, page 358, it says, the dress of Christ's followers should be symbolic. In all things, we are to be representatives of him. So our outfit ought to represent Christ, right? So malayo pa lang, as I said, they should be able to tell that we are followers of Christ and we are of a certain, let's say, faith, like the Adventist faith, and that's why we dress that way. It's kind of like a uniform. Think of it that way. So we represent Christ through our outfit. That's our uniform. In fact, it's not just the spirit of prophecy who says um, these things about basically us dressing according to what we believe in. Look, even Ralph Lauren has a famous quote. Fashion is about something that comes from within you. So what is inside your heart? What matters to you? If your faith and Jesus is in your heart, then you will also dress according to what it, his will is. And this is one of my favorite quotes found again in Messages to Young People. If the heart is right, your words, your dress, your acts will all be right. So it really included dress as well, right? And remember, with true conversion comes clothing or covering of the body, according to Ezekiel 23. So before our, we even worry about what to wear in our outward adorning, it starts inside. It starts with what our heart cares about and what our heart wants to follow. And if we want to follow Christ and his counsel, then we will ha want to dress modestly and cover our bodies. And when that conversion truly happens in our hearts, Masunod na lang ng bayo, masunod na lang ng diet, kaga mga actions naton, no? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, for me, I delight in the Sabbath, and every Sabbath for me is an opportunity to dress according to what God's will is and um, the council. So since I had a hard time finding modest dresses, and I don't want to spend so much money on modest dressing out there for all these designer brands. I decided to design my own dresses on Sabbath and I'd like to show you some of those dresses that I've designed. And keep in mind that when I first started, of course, since it's hot and everything, I, I made sure they're below the knees, okay? And I still wore my high heels. But <laughs> that was one of the dresses I, I designed. And um, it's funny because before they used to call me Kaluka like me Angelina Jolie or Liv Tyler. But when I wore this, and since that day, they told me, Kamukha ko na daw, or kachura ko na daw si Ellen G. White. So, <laughs> I was like, whoa, are you serious? Well, first of all, I was flattered, but at the same time, that's a lot of pressure. Because Ellen White is just so amazing. In fact, if there's anyone we want to emulate, it's someone like Ellen White. No? So, Ellen White wrote all these books in the spirit of prophecy, and 
Um, she's someone I really look up to and hold dearly, even if we are beyond her, her day. So that's one of the dresses I designed. Here's another one I designed. So it's always um, long and it covers the extremities. I never went um, shorter than my elbows. I wore this in Palawan. And my knees are high, okay? So that's about 10, 10 centimeters or inches below the knees. Don't worry. I'm just wearing high heels, so it looks shorter. And then I have another design here. I used lace as well. So see, it's not so bad to dress modest, right? Abisa mga ibang tao hindi nata fashionable, but it's still very proper and very queenly. And then I also have um, this is definitely much longer, but again covered extremities and um, this is probably the shortest I've ever gone it's st I still measure it though so this is the same length as the skirt I wore a while ago during the morning it, it's below the knees and as you can see your mga private areas go covered by the blouse so it's usually looser around um, the private areas especially yung sa likod and um, yeah, now I, that's me and my mom. So my mom also dresses very modestly, as you can see. It's nice to wear these longer, longer dresses and skirts and be covered. No? I feel good, and it should never be too tight. That's another thing. Never make your outfits tight, because again, you're going to add pressure, just like the corset back then. Any form of pressure should be avoided. Okay. Now, this is a very important quote I want to share from Acts of the Apostles. We're almost done, actually. I think I have th two to three slides left. And I want to um, give you this quote because you may ask yourselves, okay, so should we then not put any effort at all in how we dress and how we look? And can we not admire beauty any longer, right? Based on everything we just listened to or heard? So here's what um, Acts of the Apostles has to say about that. It is right to love beauty and to desire it, but God desires us to love and seek first the highest beauty. And what is the highest beauty? That which is imperishable, no outward adorning can compare in value or loveliness with that meek and quiet spirit. So at the end of the day, we can all be equally beautiful inside, no? Some people always, you know, say, wow, God spent a little more time on you. You're so beautiful. You're so perfect, whatever they may say. Um, and how about me? You know, to God, that doesn't matter. God created us all equally and fairly, and we all have the chance to be beautiful inside and to have that inward adorning and that inward beauty and that meek and quiet spirit. So in that aspect, it's a competition, you know, of who has the most quiet and meek spirit, who is most beautiful inside. And, and that can only come if you have a true conversion and when you really seek Jesus and you want to follow his way. Because that glow and that, that um, intent to follow God will just radiate outward eventually and become your outward adorning. Okay. This is one of my most inspiring visuals that um, I always like to look at to remind myself. Remember, we are a peculiar people, and um, as Seventh-day Adventists, I, I'm really proud to be part of the Adventist faith. We have the complete system of truth, according to Testimonies, Volume 7, page 138. Complete ang truth sang Seventh-day Adventism. That's also one of the reasons I'm so attracted to this faith. Walang bawas, walang dagdag. It's really Bible-based, and we should keep it that way. And um, the spirit of prophecy is a gift to us. In fact, I, I really admire Ellen White so much because she doesn't even want to consider herself a prophet. She just wants people to... Everything she writes turns back to the Bible. Everything. And that's what I really admire about her. And we, you know, we follow... The, follow these counsels, we follow the Bible, and, and we are peculiar, according to 1 Peter 2.9, right? We are peculiar people. So we have to show that our, this peculiarity to the world, um, especially now, before Christ comes again. What else? In 1 Corinthians 4.9, beautiful verse, we are a spectacle unto the world, angels and men. So it is not just people here on earth within our reach that watch us and that look at us. Heaven is watching every move, every, everything we do. 
everything we wear. Heaven is aware, you know, it rhymes. And of course, finally, we should be separate from the world, right? Since we are peculiar, God never compromised. Jesus never compromised. He had a standard and he stuck to it. And there is a standard for us to enter heaven and there's a standard for us on how to dress. And we should uphold this standard um, very, very strongly, especially in our churches. No? So even for the young ones, let's, let's guide them on how to dress, which is very modest and helpful. Now, I just remembered, we also want, I wanted to quickly talk about what um, is important for men. So when it comes to the men, because they're obviously less, less inclined to fashion, it's more simple, you wear, what matters with men is that they are very clean and hygienic, from head to toe yan. So dapat yung, yung bohok, nakaayos, yung ngipin, malinis, no? make sure you, you always smell proper, and your, your nails clean, and your shoes polished. So these are details that both men and women should pay attention to when it comes to men. And of course, with the attire of men, since they usually have like a top and a bottom, which is pants, clean slacks, and um, their, their, their shirts should be, of course, not short as much as possible. If you can wear a barong is nice. I always prefer someone with a collar and long sleeves. So I think that's very respectable. Or if you have to wear a coat, that's also nice, especially on Sabbath. These are, these are great tips. So make sure to, to dress, dress for the Lord, not to impress, but dress for the Lord. And that's what you men can apply. Just remember your hygiene, very important for men. Okay, because cleanliness is next to godliness. Okay, so I know you, you might have more questions or you might have feedback for me. And I know our, our time is limited for today, but I'd love to stay in touch. And for that reason, um, I've put up some of my social um, accounts. So on Facebook, you can join me and get in touch with me at Sister Sandra. You can DM me. I read and reply to every message. Just be patient. Sometimes um, I, I need a few days, but I will reply to you. And um, if you're on Twitter, you can um, also tweet me, at Sandra Seifert. And if you're on Instagram, I love Instagram, by the way, and I will continue to, to post on Instagram more tips on healthful um, meal preparations, no oil meals, because I also, since I met Dr. Boutte and I learned about the disadvantages of oil, I don't um, eat oil anymore. In fact, gasuka ako kung may oil ang pagkaon, so ang body ko nag ang reject sang oil. No? So, I, I share on Instagram dishes that have no oil, and I also continue to share my designs. And please do pray for me, because I know that our options and choices with regards to modest dress are limited nowadays, because I'm in the process of putting together a collection of modest dresses, um, and there will be a, I will be selling these, and there will be a special discount for my Adventist sisters. So. Do, do follow my journey on Facebook and I'll make that announcement very soon on when the first collection will be ready so that you don't have to go to buy expensive dresses anymore just you know, to dress for Sabbath. You can actually just go to Sister Sandra and um, I'll have something for you. Okay, so this is for the young ones and the old ones. And um, don't, don't be discouraged to, to do, check, check out the collection. Just please keep in touch and I want to continue to pray for your church um, which is also my church in a way because Ilonga man ko especially at heart and um, I hope na bless man kamo sa mga instructions there's more to learn this is not even enough to share it all but hopefully through social media through the internet we can spread the word and we can share the light that we've received remember we have the, the complete light and um, when, when you really find Jesus and you find that light, you cannot help but share it. It's just so amazing and you want everyone to be you know, partakers of that divine light that you've received. So don't be shy, don't be scared, just share the truth, especially about the dress message as it is. And the Holy Spirit will bless you and they will touch the hearts of those around you so that they will also be inspired by you know, your modest and healthful living. This is my prayer, and um, happy Sabbath once again. Let's give all praises to the Lord.
Daddy's Coming Broadcasting Network.